we are going to get started here to um, first and foremost, welcome our attendees. Thank you everyone for registering. We have quite a few registrants for this event, so that's very exciting. Um, we are wanting to thank our sponsor this morning, the IMLS, as well as thank our panelists for joining us. So as you saw in the promotion, this discussion is about professionalism and ethics in our current marketplace. Um, I'm first gonna give you kind of an overview of each of our uh, panelists, and then I will welcome them to take the stage and um, give us their presentations. So we have on our panel today, Mike Gamblin, broker of Mike Gamblin Real Estate and owner of Idaho Real Estate School. Mike has also been a longstanding commissioner with the Idaho Real Estate Commission. So thank you so much, Mike, for being here. Welcome. In addition to Mike, we have Krista Becker. Krista Becker is a member of the National Association of Realtors YPN Advisory Board and a successful realtor at Becker Real Estate with her husband, Philip. Krista is a California native and now is residing in Texas with Philip running her real estate team. Jairo Rodriguez is a member of the National Association of Realtors YPN Advisory Board and a successful realtor from New Jersey. He is also the 2021 president at North Central Jersey Association of Realtors. Kelsey Wartman is one of our local BRR YPN Advisory Board members. She is also the um, business development manager at Silver Creek Realty Group. In addition to that, Kelsey is a member of the BRR Communications Committee. So thank you so much to our panelists for joining us. And with that, our first speaker is going to be Mike Gamblin. Mike, the stage is yours. And um, how this format will work is Mike will give us his presentation for about 20 minutes. Um, and then in that presentation at the end, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box and we will ask each of the panelists individually. So we'll, we'll do Mike and then Mike's questions and then we'll move on to the next presenter and those questions. Um, thanks so much. And I look forward to hearing what you have to say, Mike. Okay, thank you for having me, young professional realtors. Um, it's my honor to uh, give a presentation to you today. Jessica asked me to talk on uh, multiple offers and love letters. Uh, is there anything else before I launch into that that you'd like me to address, Jessica? Well, we would love to hear <laughs> the, um, you know, your personal expertise as well as the commission standpoint on love letters as well as, um, you know, maintaining professionalism within this kind of crazy climate that we're in and, and any tips that you have for us to all continue to play fair and um, keep our bar high from a professionalism and ethical standpoint. Okay, good. Thank you. Happy to do that. Um, well, um, we all know that the current market conditions in Idaho and a lot of the country is uh, low inventory, high demand, buyers desperate to get properties under contract. And as such, it's very tempting to do uh, things very differently. Uh, submitting a letter to the seller is nothing new, but it's reached a having a buyer submit a letter to a seller along with their purchase offer is, is not a new tactic, but it it has really grown and it's intensified. The Real Estate Commission uh, has no jurisdiction over this issue. They just have some suggestions that matches the suggestions of the Idaho Realtors. I just had a meeting with your uh, chief legal counsel, the Idaho Realtors yesterday. We discussed multiple issues, uh, including love letters. And I just wanna reiterate uh, kind of the commission's stance. The issue with love letters and the uh, problem that they uh, that they bring along is the an issue that this uh, it is alleged that the seller either discriminates for or against a particular buyer because of the information they learn in the love letter. So that's the issue. It really lies mostly in the lap of the listing agent and the seller, the risk of the love letter. Uh, be that as it may, I have many students in the last several years that have told me that love letters indeed work. So I know they can be effective. <clears throat> so here's the counsel that I would give uh, to you young realtors. Um, 
you young professional realtors, is um, if you're working with a buyer that wants to submit a love letter, do not draft it with them. Have them write it. Don't read it yourself. Seal it in an envelope and present it or otherwise present it to the listing agent along with the offer. Listing agents are advised to discuss this phenomenon with their sellers at the start of the listing period to uh, ask them how they would like to, uh, what their feelings are on the love letter, should one come with an offer? Do they wanna see them? Do they not wanna see them? <clears throat> if um, they look to the listing agents for guidance, it's recommended that the listing agent suggest that they not view love letters that they view the offers based on the merits of the offer. It is permissible for a listing agent to get permission from their seller to, to say to other agents that they will not be transmitting love letters to the seller, if that's the seller's wishes. <clears throat> they, uh, if the seller says they want to view the letters, then the listing agent also should not read the letter and should advise the seller that it, the best policy is that they review the offers based on the contract terms and conditions uh, as typically done. Um, it's uh, reached such a, uh, it's been uh, reached such a level, at least here in uh, the Boise area where I am, that uh, agents are attaching the love letter to the contract calling it addendum one, attachment A, uh, et cetera. If that is the case, you then are required to present the love letter with the offer. Uh, as you know, license law requires you to present all offers to the seller and any written offer signed by a buyer is to be considered a bona fide offer in all respects and to be presented to the seller. Um, if the love letter is attached to the seller, then excuse me, to the offer, then it has to be shown to the seller. It, it hasn't happened in Idaho that I know of, but it's happened in other jurisdictions around the country uh, where a seller submitted a love letter and in the love letter was information about the seller and the family and maybe even a photograph of the family. And clearly the language in the letter and maybe the photograph uh, shows that they are a member of a protected class for federal fair housing. And there's two lawsuits that I know about in other parts of the country where the buyer's offer was not chosen and they are alleging that the seller discriminated against them. So there's the, there's the problem with the love letters. Other than that, the commission, uh, other than those recommend, recommendations that I have, the commission uh, really has no official position other than to just be careful and uh, get your get the seller's view on whether they want to see them or not if the seller does not want to see them then the listing agent can properly uh, tell buyers agents that they will not be submitted in their love letter along with their offer any any questions on that so the um the downside to love letters uh, i've learned is that buyers oftentimes are researching the seller and customizing their love letter to make it more appealing to the seller with information they feel like the seller would like. Maybe the seller uh, likes pets or animals. So they mention animals or pets in their love letter when they indeed do not do not have any pets. So I didn't, I, I didn't think that was true. I was talking with a, a class, a CE class about that. And somebody mentioned that, yeah, I've heard that buyers are customizing their love letters uh, and saying things that aren't true to get the sell, but get it, to get the seller to accept their offer. And I, and I thought, oh my goodness, I, I, that is terrible to learn. And a student raised her hand in class and said, I did that before I was a real estate agent two years ago when I bought my home, I wrote a letter, a love letter, and it, I said things in there that were not true that I thought the seller wanted to hear. And so unfortunately, the evolution of the love letter may get to the point that uh, everybody's so jaded about them that they are not effective because you don't know what's true and what's not true in the love letter. But in any event, um, I know from a buyer's point of view and a buyer's agent's point of view, they can be very effective. And it's not just on the residential side. It happens in commercial as well. I had a commercial broker tell me 
the other day that he had a commercial building listed in Boise that happened to be a historic home converted to an office. It went on the market, there were five offers and one of the five attached a letter to say, here's my plans for the building. I'm not going to change a thing. I'm gonna have uh, offices just the way you have it set up and I'm not gonna be doing any significant remodel to the property. We just are gonna leave it basically the same. And based on that statement, the seller did indeed choose that offer because he was so uh, interested in the property retaining its historic value. So it is on the commercial side as well, but I think most of the time it is on the uh, residential side. And we all know as real estate agents, reading love letters is very tempting for a seller. Sellers care who, buy their, who buys their property, don't they? I mean, not always, but oftentimes they have a vested interest in who is it that's gonna buy my home. And if there's multiple offers to choose from, they may indeed choose it uh, because of information they learned in a love letter. So I know it's very tempting for the seller to read those but be very cautious. And you as agents don't read them whether you're working with the buyer or the seller. So did Jessica, did that cover love letters? Okay that for did. you? That did, we do have one question that I'll just ask now that came through in the chat. Um, someone had said that their client went to the extent of um, going and placing a letter themselves on the seller's doorstep. Um, Talk to us a little bit about that. Obviously, we can't control our, our clients' actions, but we can tell them what's okay and what's not okay. Can you can you talk to us a little bit about that example of the seller or the buyer going direct to the seller's property to place a, a, a note or an object, a gift? Well, I think that I think the principle is still the same. Um, are you from the listing agent? I think when you list properties, you should mention to them that this could indeed happen. Uh, these love letters could come their way with offers or buyer. You, I guess you now you can mention that buyers are leaving them, leaving these letters, circumventing the agents and directly delivering them to the sellers. I, I still think you should always go on record to say, I, I don't think that you should look at them. Um, I think you should make the decision on the offer based on the, the contents of the actual offer. And that's my recommendation to you but sellers can really do whatever they want to. And so can buyers. I mean, I, there's no way that you could prohibit a buyer from, from doing that. Um, so, I, but the risk really lies with the seller. I'm still gonna, I'm still gonna maintain that position. Absolutely. More of a seller issue. Absolutely, okay. We did just get another question in. Um, assuming the seller agrees to look at love letters and is okay with them, um, do we have a consensus on what percentage of the time do they actually even work and and is it even worth the seller's time is someone's question or sorry the buyer's time to I, I don't know uh any way to know of how effective they are to, except for my personal interaction with agents that uh working with buyers that write them and i remember one agent a couple months ago i was talking with him privately and and I asked him if it works. He goes, I've submitted six offers with love letters and we got every one of them. Wow. So he, he was, his buyers were batting a thousand. Now, obviously that's not gonna be the result of everyone, but I think there's no way to really know unless somebody does a survey and, and uh, I don't know of any survey. Yeah. Okay, so. perfect. So that's all the questions we have on love letters. So yeah, if you wanna segue into ethics and just professionalism uh, messaging from the commission and from yourself, that would be great. Yeah, well, from the commission's point of view, um, obviously the commission enforces real estate license law and every licensee is required to adhere to license law. Uh, license law is consumer protection. Uh, in fact, the Idaho Real Estate Commission is a consumer protection division of the Idaho state government. It's there to protect Idahoans in their real estate transactions when they work with a real estate professional. So the first thing I'm going to say is first adhere to license law. Know the law, what you can do and what you can't do. That's a great step to be professional. On top of that, uh, the National Association of Realtors has a wonderful document called uh, Pathways to Professionalism. And you might be familiar with those in the CE class that we teach at my school on the code of ethics or on ethics. Uh, we, 
we go over the pathways to professionalism. If you are unfamiliar with that, it's broken up into three areas, duties to uh, customers, duties to other agents, and duties to uh, the public at large. And if everybody adhered to those, and there's probably 15 or so things you should and should not do uh, in each of those sections, so there's approximately 40 to 50 behaviors. These are behavioral things. Not, uh, they're not esoteric concepts. They are behaviors. If everybody would uh, commit to reading the Pathways to Professionalism and abiding by its behavioral suggestions, I think it would go a long way in having our industry be more professional. But, and one of them, it, one of them is the golden rule. We all know that you treat someone like you would want to be treated. And so that would, that would really increase the professionalism, I think. Um, I, and it's not, it's not our industry that needs to work on its professionalism. I think society as a whole needs to learn to be more polite and nice and professional and efficient and good at their jobs. So it's just not real estate that is impacted by these uh, behaviors that are unprofessional. But uh, read the pathways to professionalism, treat others like you'd want to be treated. I, I don't do many personal transactions anymore. But back before I started my real estate school and uh, focused more on the education side of it, I was like you guys. I was a, I was a broker with an office, but a little dinky office with anywhere from three to seven agents at any one given time. So I was a working listing and selling broker. And you may be that as well. So I, uh, and back in the day, I, I, I sold quite a bit of properties. I would do 40 to 70 transaction sites a year, which uh, I thought was respectable. And I always, I always treated every, it's just in my nature to treat everybody nice and professional. And I still think you can do that and advocate for your client's best interests. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I don't think being nasty or rude or passive aggressive to another agent or even clients uh, to be an effective real estate agent. As a matter of fact, I think it's counterproductive to behave like that. My personal experience in life and in real estate transactions as well, working with other professionals, people like to reward those people that they like and they like to punish those people that they don't. So if you're rude or nasty or unprofessional to an agent in one particular transaction, what goes around comes around. And maybe next year you're in opposite positions and now you're the listing agent here, this agent's bringing a buyer. It's very tempting for the listing agent to um, treat that other agent poorly because they treated them poorly. So always treat somebody even nice. And I have had, in the day when I was selling, there were times when uh, multiple offers uh, were being presented. And I had agents call me and say, I told the seller, I, I thought they should go with your offer because you always do what you say you're gonna do and you're just a good person to work with. And I've always enjoyed co-oping transactions with you in the past. Or I remember some of them saying, I remember you, I wrote an offer when I was brand new and you're the listing agent. You were so helpful and so nice to me. I remember that. And I know I've gotten transactions down the road because I behave like that. So that's, uh, and I'm not doing that to pat myself on the head. I'm just illustrating that I think that's one of the best ways to be professional is to be nice to people. Did you know, and, and one of those things and one of the pathways of, to professionalism uh, tenants is to return your messages promptly. If I could, if I were the emperor of real estate and I had, uh, I could make an edict, I think that would probably be it. You either answered your phone or you returned your messages, your text messages, your emails, your voicemails promptly. The real estate commission gets calls every week from not only real estate agents, but from buyers and sellers saying, I can't get my agent to call me back. Can, can you help me with that? Consumers are stating they can't get their agents to call them back. So communication or lack thereof is one of the best ways for us to improve our professionalism, in my view. 
the lack of communication, the refusal to return messages of any type uh, by agents is so frustrating to work with and buyers and sellers uh, feel that as well. So that'd be, that'd be the one thing that I would have them do, Jessica, uh, return their messages. But aside from that, read Pathways to Professionalism and uh, try to adhere to those tenants and our industry would in, be in great shape, I think. Wonderful. I love it. Um, I think it's also just to add to that important to remember that it, when we're in those stressful situations with other agents, we all have the same end goal. We all want to get the deal closed. We can all play nice with each other. I think so as well. Yeah. I'm just looking at the chat. Should I? Um, um, I am not. I'm bringing those through to you. So on this particular um, subject, we haven't gotten any additional um, questions. If you guys do have questions, um, please type those in there and we can circle back to Mike. Actually, um, I see I see a very good question. Can I address yeah. it? Yeah. There's Best practice when working with it. Excuse me? There's some in the Q&A box, Jessica. Oh, that's, got it. That's okay. what I'm, I'm going to do the, the last one. Um, what about working with a discount broker? You can't get the listing agent to return your calls and messages. I'm preparing an offer that would be a win-win for both. The seller arranged for 30 showings. Is it ethical to drop off an offer to the seller's home? You're gonna be surprised to learn that the real estate commission's view uh, is if you can't get the other agent to return your calls, I think your first step should be talk to their broker, but sometimes it is the broker that you're having the tr trouble with. It is permissible. If you had a buyer and you want to submit an offer and you can't get the listing agent to respond, it is permissible to deliver, deliver that offer directly to the seller. Now, you're not trying to interfere with the listing contract. You're just trying to get the seller the offer. If the listing agent won't call you back, that is not against the rules for you to have interaction with the other person's client or customer, just as long as you don't interfere with the contract they have with each other. So a lot of people are surprised to learn that. So go ahead and get her, take it over to the seller yourself, Linda. Uh, what is a buyer client emailing the letter directly to the listing agent? Uh, what about, does that work right similar to a sealed envelope? Um, yeah, I think either way, transmitting it to, to the listing agents, either way would work, all right? And I know some buyers are adamant on providing them for sure. Buyers are take, doing anything they can to get any kind of leverage with the seller to get the seller's attention. I really don't blame them. But I think it's the listing agent and the seller that has to really decide how they want to handle it. The risk lies with them. Anything else? I think that's all that I see. I've probably taken too much time, Jessica. Should I let you get back to your meeting? You're good. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Um, so to our attendees, Mike will have to drop off before the end of the segment um, to go to an IREC meeting, I believe, or a BRR meeting. So if we have other questions that come up for you, Mike, we will email those to you um, for circulation to the group. Wonderful. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you for appreciate, joining us. Appreciate the, the invite. Okay. Wonderful. Up next, we have Krista Becker. Um, Krista and Jairo are both going to chat with us. Um, Krista, I'll let you kind of take the stage first and then Jairo, you can pop in um, as needed. And again, guys, if you have any questions, please just type those into the Q&A or the chat and we will get them answered. So we're gonna throw you for a loop and we're gonna tag team this together if that's all right with everyone. Uh, we kind of went through and broke it up and decided it would be easier for us to work together through this. Um, so thank you for having us. First of all, we're hopeful that we can get in front of you guys in person in the next couple of months and stuff, but we're very excited to be zooming in to Boise. And uh, my cousin actually goes to Boise State. I was telling Angela, so I'm pretty like, oh, I hope I get there sometime. Um, so um, my name's Krista Becker, and I originally started as a realtor in California about seven years ago. And then I started selling in Texas three years ago. So I do hold dual licenses and I feel like um, the professionalism that I've experienced coming from both markets is it's vastly different um, as well as selling real estate across the country is really different for all of us. So I do have to preface that what Hiro and I do in our practices may not be the same for um, your state, but I think that we'll have a pretty good way for you guys to handle uh, your multiple offer situations and how to be professional with your clients and cooperating agents. Um, Jairo, do you wanna talk a little bit about setting the expectation with clients or cooperating agents? 
Sure. So it'll kind of tie into the rest of it, but I'll just uh, keep it a little brief. So, and a quick introduction, Jairo Rodriguez. Um, I, I happen to be from New Jersey, um, and I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here as well. Uh, so yeah, so setting the expectations, whether it's on the buyer side or the seller side, um, I like to inform, ultimately is educating uh, uh, many of our clients because sometimes they just don't know what the process is like, but educating them on you know, what we're going to do, what the next steps are, and set them up pretty much for success throughout it. Uh, but what I like to do on the buyer side, um, I try to, or I, I encourage them to set the conversation or set um, appointments with inspectors, with attorneys. In New Jersey, we, we use attorneys. Uh, inspectors, attorneys, uh, we do oil tank sweeps because they're pretty common here. Uh, in essence, recommend them to all those people and have them contact them up front so that when we're ready to set or submit an offer, when I submit the, when we submit the offer, all of that information is also sent to the listing agent. Hey, we're ready with X, Y, and Z. And these are the people that are going to do X, Y, and Z. Um, I'll start with that because some of it, some of the rest of the stuff that I want to say, will go into the other uh, section that we're going into. Thanks, Krista. Yeah, no problem. I think that that's probably um, one of the first things that I learned when I started in real estate is setting the expectation with your clients first. Um, and I think that that's right. It starts with educating them and it does work both sides, buying and selling. For us in Texas, we have some you know pretty intricate selling consumer side. Like we have an option period, so you don't automatically have a right to terminate the contract on the buy side. You actually have to negotiate that into the contract. Um, so explaining that to a buyer who's relocating that doesn't actually have a chance to see a house first, that they have this right to terminate once they get here, um, you know, setting that expectation for them and providing a clear transaction out front for them, a guide for the process is going to make your life easier. And especially when they then turn around and five years later want to come to you to sell because they're going to remember how detail oriented you were the entire process when they were purchasing. I think it's really cool, <clears throat> Hiro, that you do the same thing. Um, Philip and I train our agents that when we meet with them as a buyer's guide, Part of our buyer's guide is a breakdown of our preferred lenders, our preferred inspectors, our preferred insurance people, so that they don't have to wait until they get to that part of the transaction. Because some of our clients are like gung ho and they're, they're quoting their insurance the moment that they've contracted the property and they know that they're buying and it doesn't matter what an inspection says. Um, so, you know, just depending on the situation, I think that definitely eliminates some of the hardship of getting to that step during the transaction and or your clients not understanding what to expect next. Um, I think it's one of the worst things is not setting the correct expectation with our cooperating agents right now. So I'm sure many of you are working with buyers. <laughs> I find it absolutely unreasonable that if I know a property is going to have a multiple offer situation, or if we know it's been on the market for two days and has had full days of showings and we couldn't get in, we are more than likely going to have multiple offer scenarios. But instead of updating the MLS, these agents are just leaving it blank and not responding or not answering their phone calls, which is unbelievable to me because, yeah, we're working 24-7 these days, it seems. Um, so, yeah, I think that for me, one of the ways that I address, I really want to set the expectation with a cooperating agent just to make my life easier. And just like Mr. Gamblin said, working with them in the future is going to be very important because... In, in every industry, there's a lot of realtors, but not everybody's producing at the same level. Um, so one of the things that I do is I, every time I get a listing, I have an, a predetermined offer instruction that makes the listing or the buyer's agent's life easier. Everything on that contract can be filled out based on the terms that my seller and I have put in that offer instruction. And that's uploaded in the MLS for any agent or client, it's public view. Anybody that wants to make an offer can see exactly what terms my seller is looking for. That doesn't mean that they have to write those terms in, but if they would like to make their offer a little bit easier for the seller to work with, this is what we're looking for. Um, so one of the ways that you do that is just setting preferences to closing or possession. If you know your seller is going to need a lease spec, add it in there so that they can make their offer have those terms in the beginning. Um, if you know that the showings are going to stop on Sunday night, just let everybody know when you list it on Thursday night that everything's going to end Thursday or Sunday and you're going to have an offer deadline of Monday at five o'clock. Um, and then also let them know when they can expect a reply from you, because all of these buyers are literally shopping and some of them are hanging on tooth and nail. Some of them aren't, they're just investors. I get it. But some of these people are missing the next property that's coming or not looking for the next one because they're just waiting for the word from that listing agent. 
And I have had agents that will list a property on Friday, expect a deadline on Sunday and not get back to people until Thursday or Friday. And that's four to five days of properties coming and going on the market. And my clients just sitting on pens and needles. It's not fair. You just treat people how you want to be treated. Um, I think that one of our, our NARYPN chair, Amanda Lott, posted last week, the golden rule is so important still in this industry that just treat people how you want to be treated because you will have to work with them again in the future. Anything else you want to add to that topic, Cairo? Yeah, I mean, both you, Krista, and, and Commissioner Mike Gamblin mentioned the golden rule, which is absolutely, absolutely critical. Um, and then in, in, in terms of setting expectations, uh, here in New Jersey, we have, um, on the buyer side, I, I inform my clients that when we submit the offer, the listing agent has 24 hours to present it to the seller, but the seller doesn't have a timeline. Uh, they don't have a restricted timeline that they have to get back to us on. So letting them know that up front uh, will kind of restrict that uh, or limit the buyers constantly getting back to you. Like, hey, do we have an answer? Can we have something back? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And the agents, because, you know, people are going to blow up your phone if they think that you've, you know, you've presented all the offers and aren't responding to them. They're definitely um, buyers and agents are anxious right now. So if you can just set the proper expectation for them up front, I feel like it's going to make everybody's life easier in the transaction. And then you're also going to have this level of professionalism that everybody in your area is going to want to work with you. The next thing uh, that we wanted to talk about was just utilizing tools to communicate. And that's with clients and or your cooperating agents. Um, what are some, I guess, Ira, what are some of the ways that you use to communicate with your clients to set the expectation about the process, throughout the process, et cetera? Uh set the expectation as far as communication. So I always want to meet with anybody, um, let them know that I, I have a commitment that I personally keep um, that's to respond to you, whether it's a phone call, text, email within 12 hours. Um, that's one thing just personally. But what I like to find out first also is what's your preferred method of communication? Is it call? Is it email? Is it text? Is it, you know, uh, do you prefer if it's a, a more than one person purchasing, do you prefer that we do things in a group chat so that everybody can be informed or a group email or things like that? Is regular text messaging best? Is it WhatsApp? It's it, you know, depending on where they are. I have a, a inter international clients where we only communicate uh, on WhatsApp. So uh, based on their, their kind of method, their preference, um, I'll, I'll go off of that. Just really quick, we had a question. Am I supposed to be answering the questions while we go? Sorry. Yeah, if it's relevant, um, absolutely, you can answer or you can save them until the end, whatever you guys prefer. Okay, uh, I'll go ahead and jump in on this. Linda asked, in your opinion, listing a home on a Thursday and cutting off in one to two days, isn't that cutting the seller short of an opportunity for the public to bring the best offer? It seems like everything is a mad rush. I would agree that everything is a mad rush right now. I think it depends completely on each scenario. Like every seller has a different scenario. We prefer to list on a Thursday night, late at night, so people don't start scheduling showings until Friday morning. Um, but what we like to do is schedule, and I like for my clients to leave if possible and just leave their home as a go and show for three days so that people have unlimited access. What I will say is, there are always buyers that are gone for the weekend and that's gonna happen, but there are definitely, you know, if you're a serious buyer, you're probably gonna make it in there in the first three days. So I don't, I personally haven't seen that cutting it off in three days is cutting the seller short because every one of those offers that we're receiving, we're countering on the terms that we need to, to make sure that our sellers are protected. Um, and still getting the best offer. And it doesn't mean cash because in our market, we are seeing a lot of influx from, from Austin buyers moving into San Antonio. Um, however, we've been very successful in getting our VA and FHA buyers home. So I feel pretty good about, um, you know, three to four days and then having enough time frame for people to get their offers in. I think it's really important that you don't have a deadline of five o'clock if you're cutting off showings at five o'clock on Sunday. Um, so the example I had was I had an elderly lady who was very, very COVID weary. Uh, she's a breast cancer survivor. So we wanted to make sure that she had very limited interaction with anybody else coming into her home. We sent her off to a hotel for the weekend. She did a staycation in San Antonio. We came in, we listed Thursday at like 10 o'clock at night. So nobody could schedule anything until Friday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we had like 90 showings that just everybody had go and show nobody had to wait people were there at the same time and then at the end of it we sent someone in to disinfect her entire home and she got to go home 
nobody else bothered her. I take that back. Somebody walked through her backyard. I don't know, like people do this, I guess still, but so somebody walked through her backyard. Nobody else came to her house. We had a Sunday deadline. Showings were cut off. I'm sorry, a Sunday showing cut off at five o'clock. By Monday at five, our deadline was due and everybody that had seen the house had a chance to make an offer. So I did feel pretty good that we we didn't, you know, we didn't set a deadline of five o'clock on Sunday after we'd cut off showings right away. Linda, did that answer your question? Okay, hopefully so. And Krista, you absolutely, um, uh, what you did there is explained it more thoroughly because I think in saying just put it Thursday and end it Sunday, you might think that, hey, you're not giving everybody an opportunity, but you have a plan where she's out of the house, right? You're going to have the maximum amount of exposure in those days. Um, I think that kind of, I hope that cleared it up as well. And the other thing is, you know, guys, we, my, my husband's a firm believer in like, they need to see this property in the best light possible before they ever even step foot into it. So all of our listings have this really, really nice voiceover with a video and it allows people to come in and see the home while we're walking them through it physically, basically walking and talking them through it. And then they actually decide if they want to see it. So I feel like we're putting our best foot forward for the seller. And I do understand that like some sellers are going to be completely outrageous. I know for, um, for myself, like I've had difficult sellers I've had to fire before. So I would preface that if there is a one to two day cutoff, like it is super frustrating, but it could be due to something that the seller has requested. So don't think that it's always the agent because we do have to do what our seller and our clients instruct us to do, even when we don't like the low ball offers or we don't like the terms or the response or, and people get greedy. You just, it happens and it's going to happen. Um, but yeah, I think that's definitely putting your best foot forward and getting as much marketing as you can out there before they're going to see the property and then setting all the expectations for the showings and the cutoff and the de deadline of offers is very important. If your buyer can put their best foot forward and come in with a strong offer and the seller doesn't want to wait, that's something different, but I haven't seen that happen lately. <laughs> um, but hopefully, you know, things start balancing back out for everyone. Agreed. I actually have one more thing that I actually, a golden nugget for me. I have an offer guideline that I present, um, but you just gave me a nugget where I didn't even think of uploading it onto the MLS. Like, yeah. there we, you go. We have, there. We have additional um, information page and it allows us to upload documents and like a seller's disclosure notice. So that's the other thing. Anything that's going to change the terms of my seller's contract up front, I'm going to put up there in the MLS. I don't want people to get out because they didn't get a disclosure notice or they didn't have a survey or uh, anything. So we're going to put the terms of everything there with every document so that the buyers don't have any outs so that when they're accepting this offer, they're going to have to either move forward or perform, or they're going to back out because they couldn't perform. Um, and that offer guideline, I, I don't know if in Texas, but in New Jersey, it has to technically come from the seller. So that's something as I'm doing my listing presentation, Hey, do you agree to this stuff? It actually, it's not something that has to come from the seller for us, but it's something that we go over with the seller because in the beginning, I want to set the expectation that they're going to be having contact with all of these people. And this is going to make our transaction easier because they're going to have the seller information sheet filled out. And this is going to be done beforehand. Um, so, you know, there's definitely different things that you can do in each state, but as long as you can work within the guidelines and set the correct expectations, I think that setting those expectations is the most important part. I also um, utilize, it. once we have multiple offers, make sure you're updating the MLS. I've seen people not doing that. I also utilize our showing service because you can message anyone that has a scheduled showing. So as soon as I know that I have multiple offers, if any of those uh, next buyers don't wanna be part of a multiple offer situation, I don't want them to waste their time seeing the house. So I'm gonna go into my showing service. I'm going to immediately message all of the future showings and the past showings and say, hey, we are in a multiple offer situation. Showings are still cut off at this time. Still our deadline is this, but now you know if you don't wanna waste your time and your clients don't wanna waste their time going to see a house and getting into a bidding war. Um, so it did happen. I had two people back out after that, but I felt great about them not wasting their time and then more people getting into the door at our listing. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is, is really presenting offers. Uh, for myself, I find it very important that I keep a spreadsheet. I am a list person. I have to be very organized that way. So spreadsheets are my lifeline for offers right now. The last one I did, I think it had like 12 offers from the 90 showing. So we had like, I don't know, it was insane. 
So filling out that spreadsheet, um, I make sure that I label each of the offers by the agent's name, not by the client's name, so that we're not having any fair housing violations as well. Um, I also try to be very systematic about it. So when I send my client all the offers, he's getting everything in one attachment, even though agents are sending it in like several different attachments and multiple emails. It's, it's your job to merge things and make it easier for your client to digest and go through these offers. Um, so I like to use a spreadsheet and then send everything to them additionally so that they can review. Jairo, do you have any information on presenting offers that you want to talk about? Um, I, I also have a, an Excel spreadsheet, uh, I guess, just to kind of point out, in addition to just what the offer, um, uh, what the offer has, I also have um, kind of, in essence, a seller net sheet attached to that. Um, so minus all of whatever taxes they have remaining, you know, estimated, of course, uh, title fees, all of that good stuff, attorney fees here, mortgage payoff. Um, they also get what their net would be approximately. From each offer. Right. Yep. That's awesome. I think that um, breaking down the scenarios for each of those offers is very important because sometimes our buyer, our sellers don't really understand that the terms of, you know, buyer approval is a little important. So for me, I go through each individual offer with them on the line and we can kind of compare. So, you know, in Texas, we have options, like I said, an option period, which means that you have the unrestricted right to terminate. So obviously for us, a lower option period is going to be very important. So anything that we do, we just go through there and we're comparing each line by line with all of the other terms of the offers, just to make sure that we're not selecting a term for another offer that isn't going to work for us. So we can go through and counter to anybody that we want to, to get the terms we want. I think that um, one of the most important things is making sure that you guys remember that you're, you're driving the bus, but your seller and your clients are directing it. And it's very important that you follow their direction at all times. Um, I think that's one of the biggest things that agents and their professionalism, it's, it's easy to get mad at somebody and, and offended by an agent and let that kind of cloud your judgment. But it's very important to remember that your fiduciary duty lies to your client and your client only. And that's the most important person to make happy at the end of the day. I also think it's crazy that realtors don't respond to their clients. I, I can't believe he said that that's still happening. It, it, yeah, absolutely. I, I also want to say, um, make sure in New Jersey, we have addendums for everything. Uh, so when we submit offers, I like to have or have my buyer sign and fill out all the addendums up front so that the listing agent doesn't have to come back and say, hey, can you give me this or that or that um, uh, later in the transaction. Uh, here in New Jersey, actually, uh, just last year in 2020, we the State Association created an addendum that if you present it with your offer, they have to return it back to you. And the, the, the addendum is in essence confirmation that the offer was actually presented um, because we have been having a lot of issues where uh, agents feel as though their offers have not been presented. Um, let's see if I'm thinking of anything else. I think that covers it. Yeah, I think that's crazy. In California, there is um, a receipted acknowledgement page that sell you can ask for the seller to sign, but I felt like um, agents still didn't always follow that guideline and have their seller acknowledge it, even if they didn't accept the offer, which was okay. Uh, for me, I, I preferred to have my sellers acknowledge everything, and that way I have the liability <laughs> off of myself for the future. I definitely, um, I think that the biggest thing is probably setting the expectation and then just making sure that you educate your clients from the get-go on any way that the scenario can go. Um, sometimes the terms of the offers aren't going to be everything that you want, but as long as your seller is prepared for every outcome of that scenario, mm -hmm. I think that you're, you're doing your best job and you're putting your best foot forward for them. One note that I did have also is to make sure that you have everything in writing. Oftentimes we speak to our clients and they say one thing and then you don't have it in writing and you may have understood it a different way. Um, just make sure that you have everything in writing. Yeah, my um, my husband, who's the broker, he, same thing, liability. He says every time we hang up the phone with our client and we have a group thread because we're working together. So it's a little bit easier for us to keep our clients managed that way. One of us will follow up with, per our conversation, here's what we discussed because I need to know whatever he decided while he was on the phone with them in the car and I wasn't there, um, especially if it's going to impact our offer or anything about that. I think it's really important that uh, you do use whatever form of communication, like you said as well, to make sure that the clients feel comfortable interacting with you at all times. I have my clients understand the expectation that when I go to bed, I turn on do not disturb 
So while you might text me because I am working with clients in every different time zone, I understand that. I might not get back to you at that time because I'm sleeping or because it's past my work hours and I don't try to work past 10 o'clock at night. Um, so I definitely think setting the expectation for them up front is very important. Anything else you want to add, Hiro? Uh, that, co that, covers, uh, that covers a lot of it. No, thank you. Yeah. Angela, what do you think? Did we cover pre presenting offers and how to deal with multiple offers? Yeah, you guys are great. Um, it, it's funny that you guys don't have the issues up there about realtors and other agents not returning phone calls. Uh, not to their clients. To me, yeah, I felt like that, but I haven't really, I mean, when he said that, I'm like, you're not calling your client back? Like, they're not going to hire you again. Yeah. I don't understand that. I don't know how much that happens for them not reaching out to them and communicating to their clients, but the agent to agent communication, I think it's just, it's everybody's so busy. Yep. And I don't think the the setting expectations, I think that's a huge part of it. Like, well, and that's the thing. There are some things that if you just simply put in the term, in the MLS remarks, nobody's going to bother you. Or I would just simply direct them to the MLS remarks to see the offer terms and the things that we need to, to discuss. But I do think that also um, Asians don't read. So I, I will be the first to say realtors don't read. I think my old CEO at CVAR said RDR, realtors don't read. And I'm like, why? But like, this is your job. So if you're going to show a house, you better read the MLS remarks because if you're showing it past the deadline, you're going to look stupid. If you're not filling in the terms of the offer based on the information they're providing you, I mean, it's just as easy as filling out the entire page with the other agent's info just to make their life easier, to make your offer look better. Uh, that's kind of how I look at it. And then the other thing I'm thinking about is if they can't complete an entire offer, are they going to kind of try to half-ass our way through the entire transaction? And sorry for the language, but I kind of feel that way about those agents, you know, when they're not doing great offers and they're not putting good offers forward, they're not going to be easy to work with, or they don't understand the contract, which is also a lot of times the problem. Right. There's a lot of new agents, I think, in the market right now. So trying to educate them. And that's what, like, I like what Mike said too about, you know, be nice. Like we're all in this together. So let's all just be nice and, and play well together. So anyways. I had an agent, um, two stories, I'll tell you one from my, Philip's story this morning. And then last weekend with my offers, I had an agent that our, our email is at becker-realtors.com. For the life of me, he kept sending it to the wrong email and he kept saying, you don't have my offer. It's, it's, I've sent it three times. I've sent it from every email. And I'm like, Hey, like slow down for a second, check the email address. It's very easy. Just slow down and read the email address. I'm sending it to you. It's right here. Krista at becker-realtors.com. And he's like, Oh, thank you so much. I sent it to beckerproperties.com. I just assumed I was going fast. I was moving fast. And my, his clients would have literally missed out on that offer. Uh, Cause I'm pretty strict about my deadlines. Like I don't, I don't really play around, especially if I'm giving you 24 hours to get them in. I'm a man, a woman of my word. And I like to stick to it. Um, and that's, that's the thing. Is, we're all busy. So like, just, there's no reason to be mean. Just take yeah. the time to help them explain it. And yeah, I, I type in email addresses wrong all the time. So it's all good. Well, and it happens to me where I've, I text the wrong person. I thought I made a phone call and I, you know, things slip through our minds. Um, so today, Philip had an agent that uh, one of our agents in our office had put an offer in and they had countered and they didn't accept the terms of the counter. They said, no, thank you. And the agent went back and instructed the, the sellers to sign the original offer. <laughs> and that's actually a rejected offer in Texas because <laughs> they had declined the, the counter. And once it's been countered, so the agent unbeknownst to our agent and our broker who he hopped on a plane to go away for the weekend. She marks it active option, sends the contract off to title, executes it, but she changed the name of the seller and she made a change to the contract and she didn't send it back to them to initial first. That's, I mean, these are things that you guys, if you understand the contract and you understand your legal duties, your client's legal duties to the contract, that, does, that doesn't happen. Right. So, yeah. My advice is always read the contract because usually like Philip says, that's usually where you're going to answer your own question. So Jessica, do you have anything to add or is there any I questions? Just, yeah, I would just add, you know, just remembering for us, because there are so many new agents out in the world right now, remembering for all of us that aren't new agents, that we were new once. And like you said, Krista, having the grace and the respect to, to you know, it's not our job to walk other agents through their job. But it is, 
it is common courtesy to say, hey, maybe call your broker and talk through this, you yeah. know, to give them a, a fighting chance, right? Um, they are the future of real estate, essentially. And so um, that's one of the things that I really try to do is play nice with everyone because we were all new once. I had um, in the last multiple offer scenario, I had two agents ask me what could they have done better in their offer terms. And I thought that was the best question to have asked because it was a very easy response for me. Here's what my seller would have looked for or simply, Hey, it was a VA offer and the appraisal was an issue. And that's, you know, it's sometimes it's an easy answer. Um, and sometimes it's, it's hard and it was a hard choice for the seller, but I definitely think you're right. Like just having a conversation. And also I feel like I should say this because it's the 21st century text messages are easy to misread people like take the tone out of it. Just, you know, take the tone out of it and just be nice. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Well, and, and yeah, just to your, what you just said, you don't know what you don't know. So for if, if a new agent is writing an offer on a, you know, with a VA loan and, and doesn't, they, they, it may be their first time. They don't know what they don't know. So remembering that and yeah, having patience with each other. That's the spirit of YPN. So I feel like um, if you've been involved, I think that sometimes that's like a natural, like cooperative attitude that you have. You're like, you're not my, you're not my competition. I'm here to just like work together. And that's one of the things that I think YPN has done for me. Like, I don't, I don't see any of these agents in San Antonio as competition or people I need to be mean to because A, I might work with them again. B, I might want them to come work at my company if they actually turn out to be somebody that's passionate about real estate and consistent because you can train people in contracts, um, but you, you can't t train people to be kind. Absolutely. Wonderful. So um, moving on then, it, does anybody have any questions for Hiro or Krista before we um, move over to Kelsey? If you do, just feel free to type them into the chat or the Q&A and we will um, move on to Kelsey Wartman. Kelsey, you're going to chat with us about the Professionalism Award. I'm excited to hear about that, along yeah. with any additional tidbits that you have um, that you're seeing in the market, either with Silver Creek or um, with just, you know, your recruiting of agents. So take it away, yeah. Chelsea. Yes. Yeah, so I want to start by saying the golden rule. That's, I think, what really inspired this award. So at uh, Boise Regional Realtors, we have... Uh, the communications advisory group created the professionalism award as a impartial peer-to-peer -peer based program that recognizes our realtor members acting professionally and ethically in the market and the whole goal was instead of you know being mean <laughs> or being negative about um you know not being ethical or professional it was to you know say hey kudos for, for being professional in the marketplace. So um, that was the whole goal of this. So I love that we talked about the, the golden rule. Um, so how does the professionalism award work? So for all of our BRR members, you can um, nominate another BRR member as long as they are outside of your brokerage. Um, and yeah, so anyone who you think who, who has outstanding professionalism, um, as long as they're not inside your brokerage. And then after a nomination has been made, um, the last three agents that the uh, nominee has had a transaction with will be uh, given a questionnaire. And that questionnaire is very simple. Um, and it, it's like a ranking system from one to 10 on uh, professionalism during the transaction, communication, responsiveness, timeliness, conflict resolution and whether they promoted the real estate industry through their conduct and whether they're pleasant to work with. So each of um, those agents will send back the questionnaire and if they receive high marks, they'll be recognized um, through the Boise Regional Realtors website, social media, um, member email, and with a digital marketing package. Um, so the we send out these or award these nominees um, four times a year quarterly. So March, June, September, and December. And um, yeah, we love recognizing people for being great in the marketplace. So let's see here. Um, so who can nominate? As long as you are a BRR member, so even affiliates can nominate, um, but only the, the nominations can only be for Realtor members. Um, I think we have a question. 
okay. I can't get the chat up since I'm sharing. It's okay. Just it's just, um, it's a link from BRR um, oh, with about the professionalism award. So you're all good. Got it. Got it. it just flashed at me. I was like, oh, I can't see it. Um, awesome. And so uh, the nominator and the nominee, again, can't be from the same brokerage. And the reason that we uh, decided to put this rule in there is just we wanted this to be, you know, impartial. We really wanted this to be because you had a good experience with this agent, not just because you're from the same brokerage and are friends or colleagues. Um, so really just getting out there and, you know, like we were talking about, you're going to work with these people, um, your, your peers out there in the market, you're going to work with them on other transactions. So be nice. Um, nominate them for the professionalism award. Um, so let's make sure I covered. Oh, big thing. You um, do not have to have had a transaction with the person that you're nominating. And that's a, a question that we've got over and over and over again. Um, so please feel free to nominate anyone. So I actually do not transact. I don't have any um, current um, activity under my belt. I'm a realtor to be helpful at my brokerage. Um, so I can nominate, um, however, can't receive the award. You do have to have completed three transactions to receive the award, um, just because that's how we're getting the, um, the questionnaire spelled out is of people on the last three transactions. Um, but it doesn't have to be transaction related. So that's a big common uh, misconception. So who can be nominated? Realtors that are active BRR members who have completed at least three transactions. And we would just love if everyone went out and nominated uh, someone that they've had a great experience with, uh, whether through a transaction or through a committee or just um, a great interaction you've had with another agent. So that's really what I wanted to say on that. Um, I. I have just really enjoyed um, Mike Gamblin's thoughts and Krista and Jairo. Thank you so much for joining us. We, um, we really appreciate it. Any questions, Jessica? None that I can see. Um, I personally have a, a question. Um, if anybody else has questions, please type them in. But one of my questions is, when did the Professionalism Award start and how many um, nominations have you guys received thus far? Ooh. Um, let's see. So we started, team. yeah, I'm like Angela or uh, Cassie might have to chime in. I want to say three years ago now is when we, yep, Cassie. Yep. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like thinking, cause I was, uh, a chair that year, I want to say. So yep. Three years ago. Um, gosh, a lot of nominations, but how many people have received the award now, Cassie? So let's see. Give me a second and I'll count them up. Yeah. We've got some from the last two years. Good one, Jessica. You stumped us. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. I just was curious because I want yeah. this to get traction and get people to get yeah. excited about it. So I, I felt like and maybe we, some numbers behind that might help. Yeah. And we did uh, get quite a bit of traction the like first full year um, that we were in. I And like many things um, <laughs> in 2020, we saw a little bit of, of a lull, but I don't think it's for lack of professionalism. I think it's... Um, we're all, <laughs> we're all a little off, you know, with COVID and the market picking up. So yeah, that's uh, definitely one reason we wanted to highlight this again, because it's a great way to boost morale um, for all of us. I think nominating someone for this feels good, receiving this award feels good, so. Absolutely. I, I just, we did just get a question through. Um, someone asked, how many times can you be nominated? Is it something you can get more than once? Absolutely. Um, we do have a, uh, he's our committee chair actually has received the award multiple times, Sean Small. Um, so our communications advisory group chair. Um, so you can receive it as many times as long as um, all of those questionnaires come back with good marks, you can receive it. So you can be nominated multiple times and receive multiple times. Wonderful. So I did um, add it up in 2020, we had 12 recipients. And in 19, we had 16 recipients. And we'll have at least two in June as well. Nice. It's upcoming June. Awesome. Yeah, we'll be excited to announce those. <laughs> I, have a, I have a quick question. Yeah. What happens if you don't get any of your forms back? What happens to the person's nomination? They do not receive the award, but we do hold on to that nomination and wait for those questionnaires to come in. 
and we'll try we'll again. Miss the cutoff. Um, we can hold on to it for the next quarter. Um, and as a as our advisory group, we actually do our best to reach out to those other agents because people are busy and maybe they missed the email. Um, we reach out personally and say, hey, you know, I, did you have a good interaction with this person? We'd love to um, have you fill out this questionnaire so they can receive this award. So we do kind of um, go out of our way to try and try and get those questionnaires back so that we can um, present those awards. Wonderful. I do have, again, just one um, uh, final question. Hiro and Krista, do you guys have anything in your market um, that is similar to this? If so, would you um, share a little bit about it? If not, no worries, but just curious if other markets are doing something similar. For the professionalism award? Yeah. Um, I actually don't think that San Antonio does anything like that. I know that my old association in California did. Um, they didn't call it the professionalism award, but I do believe you had to be nominated and you had to do some nice things in the community and stuff. Um, but I will definitely bring that to their attention. I don't know if it's possible, Angela, you might be able to send us like some information about it that I could present to them. Yeah, I think Cassie, would you be okay with that? Oh it's yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, of course. I, this is something that it could probably be taken to even like NAR's level of like our YPN committee at the advisory board if they were able to like nominate somebody for a professionalism award. I know we do the Elevate Award, but yeah. I kind of think the other one is just as important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll put some stuff together and, and send it and see. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Love it. Well, thank you everybody for participating. Thank you panelists for giving us your time and your expertise. Um, that's all that I have, Angela or Cassie, um, anything that you need to add at the end? I just wanna give a huge shout out to Krista and Hiro for jumping in. We were supposed to have uh, Jeff Kahn, but he got swapped around with another board. So thankfully Hiro was able to jump on and help us out, which is greatly appreciated. Um, we'll try to get these NAR YPN folks to more of our events once NAR lets us travel yeah. again, but uh, anyways. <laughs> Y'all don't know how lucky you are to have Angela, man. She is just a rock star and we love working with her on the advisory board. So I am I am beyond blessed that she invited us to do this. And I hope that I get to come see you guys in person this year. And you guys, I put my email in the chat. You're welcome to ask me any questions. If your YPNs need me, if you need anything, please reach out. I'm absolutely a resource to everybody here. Yeah, and I have that too. If, it, if, it, if you don't get it in the chat, we've got their contact information. So. Yeah, yeah Krista, Krista, we're well aware we have the best staff. <laughs> we're very so lucky. Jealous, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. We all we all work great together. I couldn't do half the stuff I do without Cassie. So <laughs> awesome. Well, you guys, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. We're we're early, which I think is better than anything else. So um, if there's no other questions, we'll let everybody go. And again, appreciate your time today, um, Kelsey and and Hiro and uh, Krista, all of you.